Welcome, I am Cyril Stoba. Road transportation is a key facilitator of the economy, there's no doubt about that. An extensive network of roads crisscrossing the country is also not in doubt. But it is also true that this critical infrastructure had suffered in the past from neglect and poor maintenance. Right. Shelter is a basic necessity. Now, over the years, it's been a key issue in the programs of virtually all administrations. But questions may be raised on how well the country has provided this basic need for its huge population. Now, the Buhari administration at inception committed to improving the lot of the people. Six years down the line, we take a look at developments in roads and housing infrastructure. Today, I'm sitting with the Minister of Works and Housing, a former governor of Lagos State, two-term governor, in fact, and a senior advocate of Nigeria, Babatunde Raji Fashola. Minister, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Right. You're not a stranger to Herculean tasks, if we might put it that way. Uh, you spent eight years as governor of Lagos State, easily described as um, a mini Nigeria, the melting pot of all Nigeria. And at the start of the Buhari administration, the first tenure, you were at the helm of affairs of three huge sectors, power, works, and housing. Uh, in the second uh, term of the government, you've had the power taking off, but there's still a lot of work in works and housing. Tell us, uh, if we might start this interview from this premise, your background, having administered a complex state like Lagos, and also your background as uh, a silk, did that prepare you for as we describe it, the Herculean task of works and housing? Without doubt, uh, my previous stint as governor at least uh, exposed me to the workings of the civil service because uh, we must never forget when all of the political promises have been made and uh, recorded and there is time to act, it is the civil servants and the public servants who ultimately constitute the 
boots and nuts of implementation of any government anywhere in the world. And so it is important to understand their mindset, to provision for them, to motivate them, uh, to inspire them, improve their working conditions, and in that way you can get the best out of them. So that was a useful background, a, a good place, uh, experience that, brought, that I brought with me to the federal, federal government level. All right, so works and housing. Um, the first thing most Nigerians would easily think about, roads. Yes, we have uh, one of the biggest networks of roads in Africa. But again, over time, there's a lot been said about the state of those roads. Um, within the lifespan of this administration, would you say that you have made some considerable improvement to the quality and the state of the roads? And so from then, we'll, we'll take it one by one. It's not just the quality, but also the quantity. Um, the president has been very clear that our infrastructure will be one of the pillars of our road to prosperity. Um, infrastructure does so many things, uh, apart from providing the fiscal infrastructure that people see. It is also the, uh, what I call the most legitimate way mm. to distribute money across a society. So from when you are planning to build anything, uh, a lot of professionals are employed, architects, survey, geotechnical, all sorts of people are involved, up to the point where the contracts are awarded, the banks come in, they provide the funding, the guarantees, and then the contractors move in, then they order the material, cement, bitumen, granite, sand, and then labor comes in, you move machine. So the president is very clear about the purpose of infrastructure in the road to prosperity and also how critical this is for the improvement of the human condition, uh, which is the essence of our party's ideology, progressive ideology, to improve the human condition. So where are we? We have at the moment over 13,000 kilometers of road under repair, reconstruction, or rehabilitation. We have 47 bridges under maintenance. Um, and um, in those 13,000 kilometers, we have uh, about 850 different contracts. So there is no state in Nigeria where we are not fixing at least one road. In some places there are 10, some places there are more. So, and also we are making progress uh, on many of the key roads. On a road like Sokoto to Kotangura, which is about 480 something kilometers, we have completed about 420 kilometers. On uh, Kano Maiduguri, which is about 560 kilometers, we finished about 389 kilometers. Enugun Potakot, which is about 226 kilometers, we finished about 124 kilometers. Lagos, about 127 kilometers, we are now at 80 something kilometers. Uh, bridges are being completed. Chachangi Bridge is going to be open very soon. The Enugun to uh, Cameroon, Bamenda to Mfum Bridge, will be opened sometime in August this year. Uh, local Weto Bridge completed. We're working on the road, but people are already using it because it saves you four hours mm. between the east of Nigeria and Abuja. Uh, I mentioned Econ Bridge in uh, Cross River also nearing completion. The big one, Second Niger Bridge, hopefully we should finish next year. Right. And, and there's so much, so much more to talk about. But we, the, the, the progress has been, has been very, very slow. Uh, methodical, but the results are beginning to fructify. Uh, journey times of commuters are reducing, and um, the economy is getting better for it. Right. Well, 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 Minister, as you read out these uh, projects that are ongoing or completed, um, we must ask this because uh, frequently we do hear senior government officials talk about uh, the positive funds. So, 
these projects, are we saying they're not going to suffer as a result of the paucity of funds? They're competing with other projects. How, how are they funded? It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging time for the global economy and Nigeria is not exempted. And if we look at what is going on across the world, first of all, there is massive borrowing by many nations, if not uh, almost all nations across the world. So the debate in the U.S. Congress now is where are they going to get the money to fund the infrastructure plan of President Biden? Uh, the United Kingdom borrowed, I think, 952 million pounds last year. So no country is immune. And everybody, even those who have more infrastructure than us, are investing in more infrastructure. So it is the way to project power and to project wealth and to project prosperity. So where is this coming from? A mixture of choices that the president has, has uh, helped us to achieve. There's borrowing. So you hear every year in the budget the deficit and how we plan to finance it. There's also investment coming by way of uh, Sukuks, uh, which we have deployed to about 44 routes. There's also private sector participation, the Road Infrastructure Tax Credit Fund, which the Dangote Group and the other couple of uh, players are applying. So that is helping to build the roads like the Apapa Urunshoki Expressway in Lagos and the um, uh, Obajan Akaba Expressway in Kogi. Uh, and we will soon announce another raft of projects that have been approved for this. And of course, let me remember to mention the Bodu Boni Bridge uh, being funded through the tax credit scheme by the NLNG in River State. That is a project that had failed three times. So this is the fourth time and work is progressing now. Again, uh, all with the support of the president and uh, all other arms of government, including parliament. So we still have to borrow. We still have to make this investment. We also have to look at opportunities where private sector can play a role. And uh, it's not an easy street to walk. Right. And certainly this drives up uh, the cost implication of these projects. So the question would be how, especially for uh, the projects that you've borrowed, how do you recoup the investments here? Because um, there's talk about concessioning, and Nigerians worry about that matter of concessioning. Understandably, because I, I think it is fair to say that the experiences have been mixed. Some have been good, some have been not so good, some can be better. Uh, but also remember that the, uh, the balance sheet of a nation is somewhat not the same as the balance sheet of a private company and the balance sheet of a home. Where the private company, for example, or the public quoted company uh, expresses its dividends in terms of actual cash and profit, the dividends for the state is the well-being of its people. They both have dividends, but they are expressed differently. So it is a choice that we must make. We can say, OK, we want to wait until when we have all the money. Prices don't stay fixed. Uh, problems don't end. As you and I have been speaking, a few more children have come into the world. They become part of the problem for this and the next government. So um, yes, infrastructure will build prosperity inevitably. And that is where the revenues will come from. Businesses will be more efficient. Productivity will improve. The total GDP of Nigeria will get better. Cost of doing business will reduce. Efficiency will come. All of this translates to savings. And the government will be in a position to see companies make more money and therefore pay more taxes. People earn more income and therefore pay more taxes. And productivity in terms of trade will make the country a much more prosperous country with its infrastructure. And it is from there that revenues will come to finance and, and pay the debt. Mind you, all of the people who lend to us will not lend to us 
if we were at the risk of insolvency or at default. So there is also a responsibility to do a KYC, if you like, know your customer, on who you are lending to and mm. the ability to pay. Nigeria may not have cash, mind you. It has assets. Right. So somehow there's still the matter of um, whether this will lead to giving out the roads to okay, private okay. sector or So let not. me come to that. Let me come to that. I have always said that roads are social assets. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily commercial assets. Mm -hmm. Almost like the runway at an airport is also a social asset. It doesn't make money. What makes money in an airport is the terminal building where there is retail. What makes money on the roads are the advertising, the toll collections, and uh, some of the services that can be, uh, 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 and real estate around it. So we are looking at concessioning some roads. We are starting with about 12 of them under the high, Highway Development Management Initiative. Uh, we have shortlisted some people who have pre-qualified, and the project development team is now going through the next phase. I'm waiting for their report. We're also looking at people who participate in vendor marketplace who provide serve support services. So what, is, what we expect to do here is to hand over some of these routes, some of the completed ones, some of the ones that are still under construction as is. So in some cases, if you were a successful bidder, we will be talking about, okay, how much do I have to pay this contractor to complete it? Or do you want us to terminate the contract so that the contractor leaves and I take over and finish it? So these are things we're looking at. But all of these roads that we're looking at at this moment constitute only 5% of the total road network, roughly about 1,000 uh, plus kilometers. So it's a... It's a small test to see what the capacity and the offtake is, but it has profound uh, possibilities for the country in terms of the investment it can bring. We are looking at an investment in the order of over a trillion naira, and we are looking at jobs in excess of 50,000 jobs. All right. This is the largest single highway concession ever undertaken on the continent of Africa. So it's that big, but it is still a small fraction of our road network. Right, even though it's a small fraction, certainly the roads that you have chosen would be um, roads that carry, you know, some considerable traffic, has to be able to test the waters. At yeah, sea. understandably, I mean, I... Yeah, I, and um, then the small matter of tolling, and that is where the whole issue uh, uh, is <laughs> on. And, uh, Easily you'd hear people talk about um, additional pains. Cost of transportation is uh, in itself high and it's likely to get higher. And um, when roads are tolled, then it's an additional burden on those who ply those roads and also for passenger traffic. What's the consideration that's going into that? That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is if you want to retain the road, in the pristine condition that they are, uh, you should ask yourself sincerely, is there a little value worth giving to retain good service? You ask yourself that question. I would pay a little more to retain good value. And if you flash back to before 2015, some of the roads now likely to be concessioned, like Lagos, Ibadan, Enugu, Portacourt, Bini, or Shagam, people used to sleep on that road. So you ask yourself whether it was worth sleeping on and driving free, or it is worth paying a little to make it what it is now, that you can go to Ibadan in the morning and come back in the afternoon and maybe go back to Ibadan on the same day when it used to take a whole day. If time is really money, and I believe it is, I think that I will pay a little to save myself a whole day, and in that sense, save myself a lot of money. But I understand how vexed the question can be, and if we say that we truly want to improve the human condition, these are the, the calculations that people should make independently. So what we have done is that we are consulting with all the stakeholders. Incidentally, just yesterday I met with the leadership of the NLC, the leadership of the National Union of Road Transport Workers, the leadership of Pengasan, 
the leadership of uh, Road Transport Employers Association, because what we're doing differently now is that we're asking the road users, are you ready to pay a toll? But unknown to them, we have also sent out people to do a national survey. So apart from a face-to-face -face recognition and interaction at ministerial level, we have people on the field, a professional company, conducting a national survey about first willingness to pay, and then how much is the uh, consensus around which not everybody will agree, mm -hmm. but there is a place where if you look at it, you will find a consensus. And, and I give you two examples very quickly, just to tell you how this works. When we concessioned the Lekki Expressway, there was some resistance. And one of the things, in spite of all the consultations that we did, one thing we missed then was that we didn't do a survey of willingness to pay. It was a lesson that we took to the concessioning of the bridge. Hmm. And you would recall that there was hardly a protest about the bridge because the price at which we concessioned and told the bridge was the price where majority of the people gathered. So some said, oh, pay 5,000. We will pay 5,000. We don't want anybody passing through Ikoi. <laughs> some said, no, pay only two naira. But there was a figure around which the majority clustered, and that was what informed the decision of our council, executive council in Lagos then. So there's, there's a democratic process, if you like, to this. So when we finish all of this, then we will present it to the Federal Executive Council to make a decision. The final point I want to make is that a toll is not a tax. It is a user fee. So if you don't use it, you don't pay it. And then a toll on one vehicle, especially commercial vehicles, is not a toll of the exact amount on everybody. So, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but uh, as, we, as we do know, uh, that's always an excuse for, I mean, for rates to go up. And say, yes, yeah, it is. And, and, and right. interestingly, one of our interactions with one of the associations yesterday, they said that, look, uh, some people would like to use it as an excuse, but they, the operators, don't think it should be an excuse. And that was very refreshing for me, that they don't think it should be an excuse if the amount is reasonable. And whether that amount is reasonable or not won't be determined by us, it will be determined by the feedback we get from the survey of the people. Right, Minister, that should bring us to uh, the matter of um, uh, durability and lifespan of these roads, if you're spending so much and uh, trying to maintain them. Then, of course, we would ask about the durability. What are the new technologies that are being adopted to ensure that roads last longer? Also under this will come the issue of maintenance. Uh, so, because uh, you construct a road today within two years, the kind of traffic that goes on it, it's gone before its lifespan. So what are we introducing? Okay, so before I tell you what we're introducing, let's go back to what we should have done. Mm. The industrial cargo of any nation is not transported on its roads. Mm. It is transported on its waterways, and on his rail. Sadly, those are areas that we haven't optimized our capacities. But happily, the Lagos Rail to Ibado is now in service. Mm -hmm. It should finally get to the port. And what we expect to see in the near term is that most of the containers and all of those things, uh, heavy duty cargo that we see on our roads um, will not be on our roads anymore. They will be on the rail tracks, uh, including our fuel. So, but in the interim, what are we doing? Let us also understand everywhere in the world, those who know will tell you that a road is a depreciating asset. And that is why the final surface where we drive on the asphaltic surface is actually called a wearing course because it will wear. How quickly it wears is now a function of how well it is used or how badly it is abused. Mm -hmm. And abuse comes in terms of excessive loading and 
non-compliance with actual regulations. Again, the President has given directives, so we're enforcing from loading points. So we're working with the MPA, for example, to restore the operational calibrations of all their uh, weights and uh, skills for loading. So that's going on. We're also working with uh, the petroleum sector. We're seeing some, some levels of compliance. But in terms of quality, we are building perhaps to the highest ever quality. Uh, our quality was one of the best, if not the best in Africa, but we even upped that. Because we're now finishing with what is called polymer modified bitumen. And it is a, a strengthening of the normal bitumen and asphalt that we're used to, uh, strengthening with what is called polymer to give it uh, longer uh, wearing and load-bearing capacities. And also the, uh, the sub-base of our road, which is really the road, the pavement itself, where the concrete, the laterite, and the cement and uh, sand mix are, 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 are compacted together to, to, to build the pavement. The designs have been expanded to improve their load-bearing capacities. And you will observe that on many of the roads under construction. But ultimately, uh, also, some of the things we do and help to depreciate the road quicker than we think is not just the trucks. It's those who pour water, those who change oil, those who empty fuel. You see, because this is it, all the soil the limestone, the rocks, the cement, all what we've tried to achieve is a binding process. Mm -hmm. Now, what is oil? What is petroleum? What is petrol? They are all thinners. They begin to break the molecules of what we have put right. together. And they do much more damage than we care to admit. So all of us must become much more aware about the damage we are doing perhaps without knowing it. Right, but you, you, you do find a huge, huge uh, uh, conglomerates of uh, trucks parked on, on, on roadsides, and um, it's been almost impossible to dislodge those trucks that park on the roadsides. I mean, isn't that one, one thing you should look at? We, as a ministry, our main responsibility is to deliver the infrastructure. Hmm. There is another agency, right. although we work in very close partnership exactly. with them, the Federal Road Safety Corps. And uh, they, they, to their credit, uh, they, they've recorded some successes, at least I can point to Ugiri, which used to be a very uh, uh, severe point of constriction on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. With the support of the president, we've, we've removed that and we intend to get to more. Uh, just yesterday, we were supposed to hold a meeting with uh, uh, governors of Kano, Kaduna, Niger, and the FCT with regards to solving the problem on the Abuja Kano Highway. Uh, we rescheduled that meeting to next week because they had some urgent uh, matters of state to also attend to, and we thought that this should defer to that. Uh, so, again, these, these things need to be, but it's not just enforcement, it's, it's enlightenment also, and also provision of alternatives. So we need to deliver, uh, if you like, some more trailer parks. We need to build some more rest houses. So rest houses will come under the concessioning program. Okay. Uh, way bridges will come there right, where there will uh, be enforcement. Of course, that will, so way, the way, way bridges, bridges are, are not just bridges to way, but also you must have the capacity not only to offload excess cargo, but also the warehouse to store them. There are existing way bridges right now. Obviously. There are, but there, but there were no warehouses, and then most of the existing way bridges uh, have to be removed because we are reconstructing the road. Yeah. They will be reinstalled yeah. when when we doesn't finish. worry about this. Sometimes you see trucks that come from neighboring countries. Mm. Um, the, 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 the cargo is spread out, maybe two or three trucks, and they get to Niger, Nigeria's borders and they load it all up in one truck. Yeah, there's an through. actual load regulation for the whole of ECOWAS. Mr. President has also signed that, and we are doing our level best now to ensure compliance. So you can see that this is a, a journey. So 
as we build the roads, we now improve the enforcement capacity, we provide the infrastructure. So way bridges will be part of infrastructure for enforcement and protection of the road. And then warehouses must come because you can't offload excess cargo and have nowhere to keep them. And then you have to build warehouses for wet and dry cargo. And again, those are businesses. We don't want to be in the business of operating and running warehouses. But we made the regulations that will make them attractive to private sector. So this goes back to what I told you earlier. The road itself is a social asset. Mm -hmm. But the commercial opportunities lie right. along its entire corridor. Uh, still just one or two matters um, uh, regarding roads. And uh, one of them is the signage. And uh, you, you drive around this country and there is, it's clear, inadequate signage on, on the roads. And this can get confusing sometimes. Um, plans to step up proper signage? Of, of but you must admit that in the last five years, the signages on Nigeria's road network have become visible perhaps for the first time in my lifetime because I made it a personal commitment that you don't need to ask anybody if you can get a map, you should be able to drive from one part of Nigeria to its most furthest part. So. Uh, I've made it mandatory now that we won't complete any road, we won't sign off on any road until all the signages, the kilometer posts, the uh, signage route assurances, and also the lane marking is finished. So it's now standard, standard process for completing a road. We used to build roads before. These things, uh, I gathered, were part of the contract, but for some reason they were never done. But I've insisted now, and uh, I'm happy to report that there is uh, substantial compliance by our contractors and so in the fullness of time this will be a story behind us. All right. Two other things which were my there are of course um, certain roads um, within the country that um, for you know understandable reasons um, uh, people worry about. I'm talking about for instance Abuja, Kaduda, Zaria and Kanu. Yes work is going on but um, you do hear the questions, how long will this take? There's also the issue of the expansion of Abuja, um, Kefi, um, there's the other axis of Akwanga and all that. And these roads, there's considerable interest in them. Okay, those roads are uh, works in progress. The Abuja Kaduna road is 375 kilometers. Um, it has about 41 bridges on it. Uh, it has an average daily traffic of about 40,000 vehicles between Abuja and Kaduna. So we have to build where people use the road. And we have to make diversions. We have to uh, also protect workers. And, uh, and we have also to deal with challenges of financing. So it's not as if all of the money is in one place. So the money is coming from a presidential fund made up of dividends from the NLNG to the federal government, made up of recoveries from the uh, 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 Abacha era, and uh, under a governance protocol supervised by uh, agreements made between the government of Nigeria and the government of the United States, and also, we now have uh, non-governmental organizations uh, represented as part of the conditions for the release of those, part, those parts of the money. So there's a process, and those processes take time. So these are, these are the real issues. Apart from the actual construction, then we're talking about relocating services. So on that road, as we speak now, we have had to give approval to the Abuja, uh, 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 the Abuja Kaduna pipeline process, Ajakuta, AKK, uh, to pass through. So we have to wait for that to happen before we close up on the road. So these are some of the things that people don't see. We just don't go and start rolling a road. You have to move uh, lines, electrical lines. You have to move pipes water and fuel. You have to move uh, cable for digital services that have been laid in order to reconstruct the road. And then you have to reinstall them back. You have to move people. People have also encroached. Some of those trucks 
markets, mosques, uh, shops have encroached, so they have to be relocated before we hand over the site. And we do this maybe over 10, 20 kilometers, they construct, we divert traffic, then we move back. So it's a huge logistic operation, but we are giving it our level best. And uh, there's progress being made on the road. Sections of it are being completed and open to traffic daily. Before we leave the roads, um, in the past, federal roads located within states uh, that have gone bad, the state governments had undertaken to fix them and then build the federal government. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, why is that? Well, they built the federal government and the federal government did not pay. So it was President Buhari that inherited the debt. The debt was in the order of over a trillion naira. Uh, we have certified about 577 billion naira that have been paid to states. That is part of the borrowing. And it is important for people to understand this. President Buhari administration is paying the debt inherited by his uh, uh, inherited from his predecessors because the states did them with approval and understanding that they will be paid. Just recently, a few more states have come now and said they haven't been paid. I chair the committee constituted by the Federal Executive Council to review these things and then what we verify, we will send back to council to consider and to approve. So for now, you've put up... You've put so the president has said, let me pay the debt that I have inherited. Okay. I also want to plan the roads that I will build. Okay. So mm -hmm. don't incur more debt on my behalf. Spend your own resources on your own roads. Let me spend my own resources on my own roads. And don't dictate the pace at which I will run. All right, Minister, we'll, we'll, we'll step away for a while from the issue of roads and um, come to this other worrisome aspect of um, shelter, housing. <laughs> um, it's a tough call, you know. You, you don't get to know what actually is the state of housing. No, all kinds of figures are bandied around about uh, the housing deficit. And, and so I wouldn't go into quoting any figures. I don't just ask, what, what, what have you assessed to be the actual housing deficit in this country? Okay, so it's, it's, it's a good place to start. And let me say very categorically that we have told ourselves a lie mm -hmm. that we have a housing deficit of 17 million. It is a lie. It is a lie that stemmed from maybe, uh, for want of a better word, detail, because I have found where the figure was first published. And I spoke to the person who actually authored it this morning, hmm. because I was coming on this program. And I said, I'm going to say this today. Did you have any data for doing this? And she said, no. It was a housing policy written in 2012, and it was in the foreword that people normally sign, and probably somebody just drafted it, and maybe from the pressure of work it was signed. And that's where the 17 million came from. Because I've asked the World Bank when I became Minister of Housing, they said no, that figure wasn't from them. I've asked the uh, African Development Bank, they said it didn't come from them, and I found the source. It was a housing policy in 2012 from the Ministry of Lands and Housing, in the foreword, so, and there's no scientific basis for it. And I want to urge Nigerians to stop quoting that figure. It is not based on any actual data. Now, let's move to data. Mm. I have asked the uh, uh, um, DG of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics what data they have. They have a household data. How many households are in Nigeria? At the time I asked him in 2016 or 2017, they had a figure of 35 million households. I think it's now about 40 or 40 something million. So if that 17 million deficit is correct for a household of 35 million households in Nigeria, it meant that half of Nigeria's households were homeless. That clearly can't be correct. <laughs> Just to show you how incredible and unreliable and totally baseless that figure was. And it cannot be a figure upon which we should address or plan her housing. So what do we do? What we should do first is that we will not know the actual deficit until the next census. So I have spoken to the 
National Population Commission, and I have asked them, documented a request that uh, a household a housing survey must be part of the next census exercise. How many people own their homes? How many people rent their homes? How many people want to buy houses? And so on and so forth. That would provide. But that said, my thoughts are that the, the, we must understand the problem from its reality. Housing shortages are a consequence of urbanization. So the problem is pronounced and located in our urban centers, not in our rural areas. Many people who are struggling to find a good house in an urban center own a house that is empty in their rural areas. Mm -hmm. And even in the urban centers, they are empty houses. Right. So what we want to do now, we are working on uh, some of Nigeria's uh, famous urban centers, Aba, Portakot, Abuja, uh, Kanu, Kaduna, uh, Weri, Ibadan, uh, and so on, to see what the deficit is. How many houses are empty and unoccupied? Houses that have been empty and unoccupied for over a year, and why they are unoccupied. Because also the solution is not necessarily just to build. If you have things that are unused, I think the sensible thing is to find out why they are unused, how you can unlock them and make them accessible before you really know what your supply need is. And that, that is that. But there is good news. Uh, we have rolled out a national housing program. Again, just to validate what people want, we are building that in 34 states. And uh, we've got a couple of thousands ready that we will soon start allocating. That is directly by the ministry. The Federal Housing Authority, one of our uh, parastatals, has completed over a thousand units in different parts of the country. Again, they're offering that. So as we speak every day, people are buying houses. Uh, the Federal Mortgage Bank is also financing housing, financing construction, and also acquisition through mortgages. But you must be a contributor to the National Housing Fund. Well, uh, Minister, with the, with, with the matter of mortgages, there's, there's the question of um, interest rates. Yeah. And uh, most people, that is frustrated enough. And it stands in the way of home ownership by quite a number of people. So what's, what, what are the strategies where we can look at and say this is directly hitting at mass housing? Ah, I will not go to the word mass housing, please. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should be very careful with nomenclature mm -hmm. because it is a time that the whole world is turning its back on. Mm -hmm. and, it, 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 and, and you see, all of this mass housing, uh, social housing, they mean different things, and we mm -hmm. must be very careful. Mm -hmm. The policy of this government, and I think of every responsible government, is affordability. Mm -hmm. And that is to build in such a way that not only is the quality decent and reasonable, the mode of payment is consistent with the source of income. Wow. That is what really makes a house affordable. Right. So if, and let us look at rental, for example. If somebody like you earns your salary monthly in arrears at the end of the month. You want to rent a house. You'll be asked to go and bring two years' rent in mm -hmm. advance. Right. It cannot be affordable. Mm -hmm. And I am sure, I'm likely to be right, that if you were allowed to pay your rent monthly in arrears from your salary, that house will automatically become available those are some of the things that we should all look at. Unfortunately, government is not the owner of the bulk of those houses that are being rented. It is private people. And my appeal to people is just change the way you collect rent and you will see how much relief from pain you transfer to the whole of Nigeria. Then in terms of mortgage, the Federal Mortgage Bank can only give what it has. 
and what it has is collections from people. So it gives it out at 6%. If we are targeting um, a huge population, then um, let's uh, assume you're targeting um, a segment of society that um, is strapped, that's strapped and all that. Uh, would you not consider something that's more, as, as you use the term, affordable? These, these are the affordable options in terms of a house is not something you pay for the way you pay for a cell phone. A house is something you should pay for in every respectable society over a working lifetime, 20 years, 25 years. It's, so, so, it, it's not something you just well, go to the market and buy. It, it just so happens that even with um, those um, houses owned by the government, that um, working people, uh, civil servants for instance, uh, uh, contribute to owning, they spend all their working years not being able to pay completely for these houses. Yeah, not, uh, not, not all of them. Not all of them. Some people fall outside the, the uh, eligibility trap. But again, as I say to people, this is an ideal situation, but the reality is far from the ideal. And we must continue just to endeavor to provide as much opportunities for those who seek legitimately to own a house. And as I say, housing ownership is only one part of the housing conversation. The other half is housing rental. Hmm. And you must get onto the rental ladder before ideally you should aspire to, to the ownership. The because they also come with consequences. Uh, ownership brings responsibility, tax, property tax, and all of those things. So if you're not ready, you're likely to fall out of... <laughs> yeah, well, 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 Minister, that's uh, that's, but uh, on a, that's, on a that's good evident. Note, on a good okay. note, on a good note, I'm also happy to report that uh, a couple of states are also uh, doing the heavy lifting in terms of housing, mm -hmm. and it is states really that have much more to do than federal government in terms of actual delivery. The people who need the houses are in the states. The states is the one that controls the land. And therefore, it is encouraging that I see now many states are developing housing. We have a cooperative housing program also working with the Federal Mortgage Bank where we're encouraging people, cooperatives, to build what they can afford. Mm -hmm. And we'll give them the development finance. So we have about 58 cooperatives that have, that have obtained loans and are in various stages of building. We have about 72 cooperative associations whose applications are being processed. Uh, and I also see that the private sector uh, has put a big foot in the door mm -hmm. in, in terms of real estate, because every morning now or in the evening, well, I see all the adverts on your program well, or other channels. And this is how it should be. It's a commodity that government should get out of and private sector should deal with, where government should be playing heavily which is my recommendation, is to use its fiscal and monetary policy to make the sector much more attractive. And that goes to interest rates and some of the right. exchange and rates. And for instance, things. the cost of building materials, so, as well we, as access to land. We are, we are in a good place. Access to land will have to be the responsibility of the state States, government. Right. So, and again, so we're, we're seeing all of these things when we meet yeah. with them at the ease of doing business platform. Okay. These are all of the things that we and talk about. Minister, I, I dare say on another platform, for instance, um, you belong to a party. Your party has a program it has set out to do. And um, many of the states uh, are held by your party. So beyond those other platforms, how about on the party platform and say, look, this is what we promise to do for the Nigerian people. Therefore, our governors should key into this. Well, um, I have a few examples uh, uh, within and across party lines. Uh, last year I was in Gombe where we inaugurated some houses in collaboration with the Gombe State Government. Just yesterday the Ogun State Government uh, was inaugurating some houses. The Lagos State has been the, the, the forerunner. The governor has been inaugurating one housing program after the other. Those are some of the examples, and I'm sure that there are other examples that I may not readily recall across uh, on the other side of the political divide. But really, it is a problem that uh, must be dealt with uh, across party lines. And uh, uh, 
uh, it is something for which people remain eternally beholding and, and, and uh, appreciative for any government that is able to put shelter uh, over them. Would you subscribe to declaring a state of emergency in housing, as some have suggested? <laughs> well, I, I don't subscribe to declaring any states of emergencies other than those envisaged by the Constitution, because really and truly, I have heard declare emergency in this, declare emergency in that. Uh, rather than declaring an emergency, I think what really we need to do in those places where we see the need is to act emergently, mm. act out of the ordinary, act in an extraordinary manner to change things. Declarations don't solve them. It is action that resolves them. Mm. How much uh, has the pandemic slowed down uh, the activities in these sectors? Quite a bit, I must say. Um, some of the projects we were hoping will come to conclusion this year have uh, run into next year. Some that we hoped will come into conclusion early next year have run into later next year. And this was as a result of many things, not the least the period of the lockdown, but also the necessity to alter the, the, the budget for 2020 away from the earlier plans so that we could focus on the emergent and compelling health issue. So some of the things we should have done last year, we're now doing this year. Quite aside from that, it has also increased our operational costs because uh, before now, we were working largely without masks and sanitizers on construction sites. They have now become uh, uh, regular daytime, day-to-day -day equipment. We have also, perhaps in some cases, have to reduce the number of personnel at any one time because of the need to observe social distance. Uh, cost of keeping equipment safe has also gone up because apart from servicing the equipment, we now have to clean, spray the stirrings and all of that, the gears, when people, when the shifts take over. Those come to cost at the, at the end of the day. But, uh, it's, uh, we're moving instead of being in one place and uh, mm -hmm. we're learning new things as we move forward. And uh, so those are the ways in which we have been impacted. Well, we started off um, looking at roads and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps we'll just, as we begin to wind down, we'll just uh, take an insight into what are two more projects. I said at one point in time that there were roads that were attracting a lot of in, in, uh, interest for, you know, certain reasons. And I still have a couple more I might like to draw attention to. Promise. In the past, it was um, generally accepted or believed that all the neighboring states linking the federal capital territory, Abuja, would have dual carriageways accessing them. Um, so far, that hasn't really played out. Some states bordering the FCT also serve as a link between the north and the south, and they have been burdened. All the federal routes passing through, and with the state of routes, they have had to face increased traffic. I'm looking at a state like Niger State. For instance, Abuja, Suleja, Mina. Mina, Bida, of course, you spoke earlier on of the Contagura roads. What's going to happen about those places and what is the progress on trying to fix so many of these roads as to reduce the heavy traffic, you know? You see, again, let's, let's take it from population. Population is growing. So, uh, but let's also understand that there was a period when uh, um, we were not investing this much. Mm. And the budget I inherited for roads was 18 billion for all of Nigeria's roads. That was going nowhere. So we must first acknowledge the radical shift of the Buhari administration in how it applies its resources to build infrastructure. Now, this is not a one day problem, so it's going to take some time. And we have to build those roads kilometer by kilometer. Mm. So you spoke about Akwanga, uh, Abuja to to, to uh, Makodi okay. Highway, as we call it, 
uh, goes through Mararaba, mm -hmm. uh, Kwanga, Kefi to Lafia. That is under construction now. But the phase two of it, which is from Makodi to uh, Ninth Mile to link the east, uh, is what we are waiting for the loan. We're working on the uh, uh, road from the airport through Guagualada to Kugi. You will see work going on there with the Sukuk. We're linking Niger through uh, Abuja to, to uh, Kanu, as you rightly mentioned. So that road is getting an uplift. Uh, as I said, we were supposed to have a meeting yesterday. We have a contractor now on the Sule Jam in a road. It was uh, essentially an unmotorable route when this administration came, and undoubtedly progress has been made. We don't have all of the resources to put there at once, but right now at least there's a contractor there, inch by inch, kilometer by kilometer. We will get there if we had more resources. You know what? There was a time, I think in 2005 it was, this country had $12 billion. These roads were bad then. And what did we do? We went to pay creditors. That was a major policy decision, which uh, I think we, 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 we perhaps uh, should, have, should have processed differently. I think right. it would have been useful to have invested those resources in Nigeria, grow the economy, renegotiate, and pay your debt. Oh, well. We might have to leave this conversation here. There's still so much to talk about, but we're hoping we'll ask you to come again sometime and uh, explore further uh, the developments in roads and housing. But for now, we'll say uh, Babatunde Raji Fashola, Minister of Works and Housing, the Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Thank you for coming on One and One. It's been interesting talking to you. And, thank uh, you very much for you. having me. Thank you. And that's our program today. Next week, we'll be back with One on One. I am Cyril Stober. Continue to stay safe.